and welcome back, everybody. I'm Dan John from danjohnuniversity.com, and this is our weekly podcast. Today's episode is episode 231, and that's a lot of episodes. So thank you. Uh, this is a question and answer uh, podcast. So if you have questions, send them to us at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I do my best to answer each and every one. Uh, we get a lot of repeat questions sometimes in a short band of time. So we'll kind of, uh, you know, combine them a little bit. But other than that, I try to do my best to answer each and every question. So let's get started this week. Our first question is from Jay. My dad, like most, isn't getting any younger nor any stronger. My mom wants me to try to get him into a workout routine as he just pulled his back the other week trying to move the sofa. Um... Yeah, uh, it's one of the things I'm still very proud of. Uh, I'm 66 years old uh, at the time of this podcast, and I'm still the number one person people ask to move couches, sofas, and all the rest. Um, it's it's good, and I think, of course, a lot of that is from lifting all these years and from doing loaded carries for the past quarter century, and that can sometimes make a difference. I started lifting weights in 1965, and Started doing loaded carries uh, in the late 90s, early aughts, and I think it just keeps you young. So when I answer your question, Jay, I'm going to use my experience to tap into what I think you need to do. He currently does body weight exercises, but very infrequently. So in other words, uh, in my experience, <laughs> that sentence means he doesn't do anything. Where do you think I should try and start with him? My mom thinks he'll respond to me better than her, but I live eight hours away. They have kettlebells, 12 through 20K, a pull-up bar, and a TRX. He has all the time in the world. Any tips would help. Well, first, this back injury, I hope, would be a wake-up call because there's only two directions you kind of go with a back injury, especially if you get that kind where it feels like uh, someone cracked the whip where you, ah, and it feels like a lightning bolt hit you and you just, you're in pain for months. You're either going to go in a better direction and, you know, take care of that, uh, extra uh, uh, barrel you have in the front, uh, get the walking in, uh, take care of business. Uh, I remember Dr. Morgan telling me years ago that he wanted me to walk every day for a bad back and Stu McGill years later said the exact same thing. Um, the exercises uh, Dr. M uh, uh, Morgan gave me were very similar to uh, Stu McGill's big three, uh, different but similar. Uh, and so if you do hurt your back, the best thing I can think of is walking, followed by uh, intelligent uh, ab core abdominal exercises that kind of teach you to stay braced and locked down during the rest of life. The other direction your father can go is what I often see, and that is just uh, people put their feet up in a comfortable chair, they get the TV on, and they just sit in the chair, kind of exasperating <laughs> the issues of, of the injury. So let's hope your dad uh, turns in the right direction. The first thing I would say is, if someone's coming back from an injury, you, you, have, you have three kinds of equipment here. You have the kettlebell, which is great for, uh, you know, it's, the kettlebell is great for all kinds of things. I think it does, you know, I, I remember telling people who used to say that the, I used to say that the swing is a fat burning athlete builder. And I, I still think that's true. I still think, for athletic movement, the kettlebell swing is really a good thing to learn. Uh, obviously, with presses and front squats, you can do some hypertrophy work. You can also do Turkish uh, get-ups and that whole family of of, of the, wind, the windmill Turkish get-up and then some of the variations of the bent press to work on, you know, the mobility through the whole, the whole spinal column. So it is a one-stop shop, but if you're coming back from an injury, I would shift over to those other two pieces of equipment you have, the pull-up bar and the TRX, our suspension trainer. The nice thing about a pull-up bar, and if you can get them just to hang, good things will happen. Now, in my experience, almost everybody who has back injuries also seems to have shoulder injuries. Um, this is, you hit a certain age and everything just, starts to catch up with you. Um, um, I don't know what your father's age is, but uh, it seems like things are catching up. So the nice thing about hanging from the pull-up bar is it does great work for your shoulder health. But one of the things, and uh, I, I always joke in my uh, in my gym, 
you know, I'll, I'll be hanging up there and all of a sudden you'll hear this pop, pop, pop. And then I'll pop off and I'll say, that's the poor man's chiropractor because it does really do a lot of great work for this whole area. Boy, I, I mean, it, I'm, I'm touching the base of my skull probably to below my, my scapulas that it really seems to help me there. And of course, this is what I do every single day for that reason. And I also sit at the bottom of the goblet squat every day. Uh, and I've even figured out a way to do that in my sauna with uh, a fun little, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting way to do uh, mobility work in my sauna uh, where I sit at the bottom of the goblet squat. And I think that the bottom squat helps you with your, your feet flexibility, your ankles. Uh, if there is such thing as knee flexibility, obviously hips. And then it also seems when I'm sitting at the bottom and I'm pushing my knees out, my lower back gets a chance to relax and get to where it needs to be. So hanging and sitting at the bottom of the goblet squat would be two things or any kind of body weight squat. Uh, you can just even uh, grab a door handle and just use that as a, as a counter and squat down. Uh, that is how I originally taught squats uh, before the goblet squat. Um, man, we're going back a long time there. So the, those two things I would recommend first. And then on the TRX, any, uh, any of the family of the T's, where you lean back, you make T's, the Y's, the I's, the rows. I think any of that family is going to help a lot. It will be with his own body weight. So there's no challenge of worrying about load. Uh, you know, obviously you, you make, you'll make the suspension trainer harder by moving where your feet are in relationship to your hands. And, uh, you know, usually if you want to make it easier you, you with the pulling family, you walk away from the support. If you want to make it harder, you walk into it and even under it. Um, but also with that, he could even get into some basic, those kind of uh, suspension trainer. They're kind of, they're kind of a, they're a push up, but they're almost dip like in their ability to get deep. I think those are fabulous. We do supermans, uh, like arm straight and then you fly. Uh, it's, uh, it's an ab wheel. Uh, it's a great way to work the ab wall. Um, so for right now, and I, and I feel like I'm giving medical advice and I hope I, I'm not, please take it in the spirit of, you know, us having a conversation. The daily mobility of the hang in the bottom of the goblet squat, some basic TRX work and then walking and, until he kind of comes around uh, with his lower back, I would keep there. After that, I'd love to see uh, him get involved with kettlebells. I think the goblet squat, you know, for sets of 10 is a wonderful thing for anybody over 35. And if we can get him just to do goblet squats and presses, I think, and keep those uh, suspension trainer exercises, he'll have a good program. And then there's this big if. If, and then you know, there should be like some kind of weird, you know, Lord of the Rings, all, oh, you know, if, all, oh, if he's willing to do the work, good things will happen. And if he's not, well, we can have these conversations all day long. Everybody has to find their own, I hate to call them triggers anymore, or motivations, or even resolutions, that, because, you know, those are kind of like the word core. They're, these are words that are so overdone. But I think you understand what I'm talking about. He has to want to. And he's got to want to. He's got to want it. Okay. I hope that helps, Jay. It's a good question. Um, to review for anybody listening, if you get your daily hang, your daily sit at the bottom of the goblet squat, you do some basic suspension trainer moves where you do the T's, Y's, I's, rows, maybe a few that dippy push up and then some goblet squats and some, you know, overhead presses. That's a pretty good workout. You finish that with walking and you're doing okay. And remember, and this is an insight I've been lear learning and relearning for years. If you put in five to seven, 15 to 20 minute workouts every day, and a little bit longer if you decide to go for a longer walk, it's gonna keep you going a lot better than anything in the middle. So this is a final point I want to do. If you're preparing for uh, a, a bodybuilding contest where you're lifting weights three, two, three sessions a day for an hour and a half, plus doing morning cardio, 
uh, plus, you know, eating barely anything, your commitment, you know, is going to be about 24 hours a day, every day for the entire time preparing for the bodybuilding meet. I think that's a great approach. If you're not going to dedicate 24 hours a day, try to dedicate 20, 30 minutes a day. Dedicate anywhere in the middle just doesn't seem to always get your goals. Um, it's better to go every day, get something in every day. Uh, over time, you know, the, the joke we use in our gym is the five by 52 or the three by 52 method. Five days a week, 52 weeks a year, seven days a week. But uh, if we can just get him to do the very bare minimums, he, he'll see some tremendous changes. Thank you. Got a question from Ed. Ed, I'm male. 33 years of age, 182 centimeters tall, um, a little bit shorter than me, and 110 kilos with fat to lose, a little bit bigger than me. Uh, love the Easy Strength on you, but good. So many great, great insights for training throughout one's life. I'm currently halfway through the second cycle of Easy Strength for fat loss using chin-ups, military press, and the standard deadlift as the main lifts. Ed, I'm loving this. This is great. Uh, I... Uh, I know you say here you have some fat to lose, but if you're if you're combining the uh, walking after, and you you're reasonable in the kitchen, I think you'll be okay. I've really enjoyed the consistency of getting into the gym five days a week. It's one of my favorite things about Easy Strength. Doing the military press and chin ups with some extra hanging almost every day has noticeably improved my posture, and my shoulders have never felt better. Uh, seemingly undoing years of damage from rugby union. <laughs> It's a great sport, but it's tough on the shoulders. So far, I haven't need to change the lifts with the military press and the standard deadlift, slowly increasing the rate. Wait, good. I know from reading the book that squats often don't work with the five-day easy strength program and to just use goblet squats for keeping the movement and mobility, but I worry that I might be leaving potential strength uh, uh, squat strength gains behind, especially with my plan of sticking to the program for six months or more. I was thinking of incorporating squats into three to three of the five workouts. Something like day one do front squats three by three, day two do overhead squats three by three, and day five do the front squats again, alternating the exercise each week. What are your thoughts on this? Um, you know, I have three different chapters in the book on why it doesn't work. And the the issue with squats and easy strength is that if I was to have somebody do three sets of three in the deadlift uh, or military press with 50%, say starting starting day 50%, which by the way, if you're a good deadlifter, still is a heavy weight. But, you know, um, it's pretty simple. On the third set of three, you put the weight down and you're like, okay, I can come back and do that tomorrow. With squats, and I think it's because there's so many joints working under stress to make it happen. Now, I know the deadlift is just the same. But the movement of squatting is just a for for people like myself who are not born squatters. Uh, that movement tends to make people get a little um, overworked. I like your plan. I, I like your plan a lot. It reminds me of what we have people do with the ABC workouts. You know the two one two one two one approach over the weeks, which is what you'll be doing. You'll be doing overhead squats twice one week, once the next week, twice. You know back and forth. This might be a good idea. I would, I would caution you to make sure you stay light. And I do like the fact that you're flipping exercises. I like that. Uh, and on, honestly, it's something I never uh, considered um, of doing that. Um, I certainly am a big fan of switching exercises. Uh, in some of the programs we do with Easy Strength, uh, depending on who it is, we often will move an exercise every two weeks. Now. You have to listen to this though, like go from bench press for two weeks and then incline bench press for two weeks and then decline bench press for two weeks. So it's not like you, know, you throw out everything and start from scratch. Uh, if you're doing conventional deadlifts for two weeks and then the snatch grip deadlifts for two weeks and then uh, deficit or you know uh, duck foot, you know, you keep your heels together deadlifts, uh, you can make some interesting progress doing that too. I like your idea, uh, but the only thing is I. I don't have any experience with it, you know, in total honesty. I've tried doing overhead squats and easy strength, but I was doing overhead squats five days a week. I've tried front squats. Again, I was doing the five five days a week. So uh, I'm interested in how this goes. And for anybody else listening who's tried squats, he might have a good answer here. And, and I really appreciate that. 
uh, you do got to get back to me and let me know how it goes. Okay. Be sure you email us here at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. And um, let's do this uh, about within a month of you listening to the answer on the podcast, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Okay. Sam, I'm a 38-year-old Italian expatriate in the United Kingdom. And I have discovered, by the way, the uh, I guess in uh, one of the largest populations of Italy is there in London. Uh, I find that interesting. And I have discovered and embraced the world of kettlebells about three years ago, mostly through uh, my work and Pat Flynn's works. Good. I do really appreciate everything you talk about. Protein, vegetables, water, walk, sleep has made my life so much easier. Now for the real question. Me and my partner are kimchi enthusiasts. We tried twice to make it and we never got it right. Would you be able to share your recipe? Thanks for everything you share with us without necessarily asking for a penny back. You are truly inspiring. Yeah, I, yeah, I really should start charging, but then, you know, yeah, I do. I guess, you know, the, the website, there's a fee, but. Okay, here's a lesson I learned about kimchi. So the nice lady at the Korean market and I had this conversation uh, a few times. I can go down to the Korean market. It's just off here in, it's just here in Murray. It's just off, it's about 44th South State. And if you go in there, uh, the nice lady sees me because uh, I come in all the time to buy kimchi. And she gives me a gallon of kimchi, which is, you know, I always get the shredded uh, or Napa cabbage kind. And there's all kinds of things in there. There's fish sauce and all these different things. And then I buy it. And I buy it for about, you know, somewhere around $12. If I was to make this same thing, it would take me hours. It would be horrible. It would cost me a lot more money. Here's what I've discovered. Now, I still make my own sauerkraut. And sauerkraut is as easy as any. I mean, sauerkraut, I mean, you just, you shred, you shred cabbage. You shove it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. You, you, you shred cabbage. You put it in a bowl. You had just a little bit of salt. You squeeze it and you can just see the salt instantly breaking down the walls of the cabbage. It just becomes very liquid. You take all that mush. You stick it in a bell jar. You put a lid on it and you're done. And it is that simple. So I do make my own, uh, sauerkraut and I add, I add other things, you know, those little seeds and stuff, caraway seeds and things like that. But even though I think I can make okay sauerkraut, I can't make good kimchi. And that's why I buy it at the store. Since I first ta started talking about kimchi, uh, I've discovered that now the store I go to called Costco has kimchi, at least the local one. And all the stores I go to now have kimchi. But I don't like those very uh, varietals as much because they are clearly, they have a lot more preservatives. And uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with preservatives. They save a lot of lives. But for my, what I'm taking kimchi and sauerkraut for, I don't want a lot in there. So if you can find a grocer who sells it, I would recommend you do that. If not, you can go online and get these recipes. But I tell you something, and I knew this from growing up with my friend Jim Kim, whose dad would make uh, old school kim, uh, kimchi and bury it in uh, jars in the backyard. Uh, when you make kimchi, uh, it's pretty obvious to everybody who comes to your house for the next two weeks that you made kimchi. So that'd be my only caveat, my warning to you. All right. So the Dan, the Dan John answer is buy it from the nice lady at the Korean market here on uh, State Street. Uh, other than that, if you can't find a good local uh, grocer who makes their own, then you might have to go in to make recipes for yourself. For me, it's cheaper and easier. Just buy it. And it's not the proudest moment of my life, but it is the truest. Okay. All right. Ross asks a question. I'd like to know your thoughts on on-the-minute training. The idea of performing a very heavy single with a barbell uh, or a set of uh, Kettlebell ballistics on the minute for power and condition is an idea I've seen a lot of certain circles, and I'd like to know your experiences and insights with it. Thank you. What was funny, Ross, is that it's come back. When I first went online, we used to have this little contest called the 100 Rep Challenge, and it was fun. Uh, there was a guy from Nebraska who uh, was a deadlift specialist. In fact, he hosted a, a deadlift, de deadlift decathlon. Uh, 
it was like, for example, one of the events was you deadlift with your hands this way. Another one was you deadlift with just your middle fingers. There was, a, you know, there was like a two-finger deadlift, a middle finger deadlift, obviously a, a variety of thick bars. Uh, there was one we, I think, we had to do it. It's called the Reeves, Steve Reeves deadlift, where you hold the plates and you deadlift it up. Well, Kim Wood, who was the Cincinnati Bengals strength coach at the time, talked about when he was young. In fact, I've got it in my notes uh, in here. Um, he one time clean and jerk, I think, 250 pounds for 100 singles. So a lot of us got into us. In fact, uh, the late, great Lane Cannon and I, it's sad to think about the four people who did it, that two are no longer with us. But uh, one time I did squat snatches with 165. That was hard. Uh, I did power cleans with one, no, power, power clean and jerk with 185, and that was easy. And then one time I power cleaned 205, and it was really easy. And the last time we did it, and this is the time I'm thinking about, was right after 9-11, so 2001, and I front squat 100 singles, I want to say, with 315. And that's back when I was getting ready, you know, uh, I was still a pretty good size engine then. And then, of course, we'd always have pictures of our hands after, and we go like this. And we, the best way to do it, uh, my brother Gary came up with a challenge, you know, where you do, he when he turned 61, he did 61 reps with 300 pounds in the deadlift, uh, 61 singles at age 61 with 300 in 30 minutes. Uh, so that's about every 30 seconds. In fact, it was exactly 30 because he started, you know, the math works out. So if you want to do 61, you do it, you do a rep, but it, it all works out. Don't worry about it. Um, I like it. I think there's real value for it. Uh, when I was at the Olympic Training Center, uh, at the time, the Olympic lifting coaches were calling those clusters where you would do, they, they would have a workout that would say five sets of five. And, you know, we'd be like, wow, that's, you know, you know, but you go, no, no, you know, cause you know, and the numbers were big, the percents were big, the, the loads were big. Oh no, don't, you, you do a, you know, you, it's, you clean and jerk it, you rest, 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 you clean and jerk it. That's a set of five. You take a longer rest and you repeat that. Um, I think there's great value in the big lifts in this kind of program. So I think obviously I've mentioned, think about what I've mentioned. I said deadlift, I said front squat, I said snatch, I said clean and jerk, I said uh, power clean. I think they're good for the big lifts, keeping the reps at one. Um, back when uh, a friend of mine was the head coach at uh, Wake Forest, he used to do that uh, to prepare his athletes for uh, Division One football games. And uh, it's it's a really good idea for American football. And probably uh, you, you need a few other things, but for a rugby team, maybe in the preseason, uh, rugby union, rugby league, sevens, there might be real value in doing that because it's that big effort, big effort. And it teaches you that you know, kind of thing you need for a collision sport. You know, when you're in a sport like American football or the rugby family, um, there's a lot of go, 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 and then there's space and time, you know? So you, you might have, you might be involved in two, three collisions in five, six seconds, and then there's, there's a gap before you, you go again. I think this style trains it well. Um, I, I've, I've read a few things, probably like you, Ross, about you know people doing one minute on the minute with these, you know, ridiculously light things or things that aren't very hard. And I, I'm sure, I mean, there's value to anything you do, exercise wise. I mean, let's be honest, there's you know, I need to beat that with a stick or anything. But there's also the issue of you know, you're just you know, you're kind of just spinning your wheels a little bit uh, if you're not, you know, doing the big lifts. Uh, for kettlebells, you know, we do a thing. I do a thing where every minute on the minute, you might do double presses. But for us, I mean, I would suggest, you know, that should be eight to 10 double presses. Uh, I guess you could do it double kettlebell front squats, but whoo, man, yeah, you, 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 you're gonna get a nice nap that night. So it's a good question. So I'm a big fan. I like it with the major big lifts. Um, and it is nice to have a, it is nice. And the final thing I think is nice, is that you can train density. Say like, we'll just, uh, 
you, you pick 405 pounds, you know, four big plates here in the United States. And you're going to do, you know, on the minute, every minute, a single deadlift. Well, that's going to be a hard workout because the accumulation is going to get there. But maybe in a few weeks, you get yourself up to 20 singles with it, 20 minutes. And uh, I would say that you, you are, you are probably, there are some good things going on, whether that's strength or work capacity or whatever. I don't know. I mean, depending on who you are, I guess a little bit, but I think it's a good program. So, all right. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Wences or Vences asks, I know that you've been asked a few times already about books, but if you would allow me, I'd like to ask you what, with a little twist, would you be so kind to give us a Dan John's ultimate reading list for the home enthusiast? What I'm looking for is 80% of the bang uh, for 20% of the buck guide, similar to what you did for the equipment on what books, articles, resources to read, learn first, and next steps to increase knowledge if need to go further down the rabbit hole for topics like strength, conditioning, nutrition, longevity. I guess that the first three done good enough Last one gets done for free, but feel free to add and remove. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, for longevity, the book I always recommend, my favorite longevity book is this one here, Spring Chicken, okay? Spring Chicken, and the guy, the author's name is uh, Gifford, uh, Bill Gifford. And he also was a co-author of Peter Atia's book, which is, you know, and it's funny. Oh, by the way, that's a, that's a good book. Uh, Somebody said that I was getting attacked online because I gave a negative review of Peter Atia's book. I did not. I did not. Of course, you'd actually have to listen to my review. So, yeah, this is in the age of the Internet. You know, if it's more than four seconds, no one pays any attention. And folks, I'm going to give long answers to everything because that's what we do. If <laughs> if all you need is... It's a beautiful insight. In fact, it's a book I'm going to recommend to you. I, I got this from Nick Peterson. Okay, so book number one is Spring Chicken by Mike Gifford. I think it's a very good book. It walks you through some of the most, uh, from some of the craziest thoughts you can possibly have about longevity to something that's workable and livable. And it comes down in every longevity book. It's exercise. Well, exercise and a social life. I find those two fascinating. Um, I'll hold bounce, uh, uh, bumpers back for just a second. Okay, so in nutrition, my favorite book, I think, is Barry Easterbrook, or Easterbrook's book, uh, Just Eat. Uh, he takes you through, uh, I mean, he takes you through WW, which used to be called Weight Watchers. He takes you through, you know, Fletcherizing, which is chewing food. He takes you through Kellogg's. He takes you through... Adkins, uh, South Beach, what they call the chop chop diet because you spend all your life chop chopping. And then he does a brilliant thing in the end. Uh, one says, at the end of the book, he says, this, this is what works for me. And I think that's the key in nutrition. I hope you heard that. This is what works for me. Uh, there's a lot of people say you shouldn't eat beans. Well, Barry finds out that beans are very agreeable to him. Uh, he also makes a statement in the book that I just it just stopped. I mean, I'll be honest. It stopped me when I read it. He said, I can't eat sandwiches anymore. And I'm like, when you first hear that, it's like, wow, what's wrong with sandwiches? Well, his point is, these are highly concentrated caloric foods. And, he, and his idea was, if you had a piece of meat here, you had to cut with knife and fork. Or if you're in England. Um, if you had two pieces of bread that you put spread on, um, and if you... If you separate, you put the lettuce here and the tomato and make it into a salad. If you eat it that way, you're slowly bringing the food is where, you know, I can eat a sandwich. Um, that that little place uh, that has the clown that's red and uh, yellow. I mean, I can eat one of their hamburgers probably in two bites because that's what we used to do when I was young. You go hunk and you get the big C and then you shovel in the other side. There's nothing more fun than going to a fast food restaurant with people trying to bulk up because you will be disgusted. Parents used to move away from us because we were disgusting, but we got bigger. So for longevity, spring check-in. For nutrition, just eat. Though I would also say that uh, um, Death by Food Pyramid 
by uh, Denise Minger is quite good. Uh, Death by Food Pyramid is also very good, very easy to get to. So good. So, so spring chicken, just eat. Death by Food Pyramid would be the advanced course in nutrition. Uh, when it comes to conditioning, boy, there's a lot of options out there. I am still going to tell you to uh, go to Bill Hinburn's site, and he has that book in there, John Jesse's classic book, uh, The Encyclopedia of Wrestling Conditioning by John Jesse. J-E-S-S-E-E. -S -S -E -E. I just saw it on eBay for like $349. Uh, Bill Hinburn's site has it from like, I don't know what it is. It's, it, I'd say it's 20 bucks. It's an older book, but, um, and I do have an original. But anything somebody invented online in the last few months, it's in here. This book is just stunning. Um, it is one of the, it, it has everything you can even ever think about. Endurance program, exercise programs, everything that got invented uh, when the internet showed up, you'll find out clearly had been around a lot longer. Uh, to me, for conditioning, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure there's a, there's a better one-stop shop than that book. So if you're going to go cheap, Spring Chicken, Gifford's book, Berries, Just Eat, The Wrestling Encyclopedia. The only problem is the book I want to tell you to buy uh, for the field of weightlifting is Tommy Kono's Weightlifting American Style. But sadly, uh, once to uh, Tommy died, um, I don't even know if it's available anymore. So what would be a great weightlifting book? Boy, there's just so many options here. Um, it's embarrassing because so many, it's funny, I was, I was looking for this book the other day and I couldn't find it and there, there it is right there. Um, you know, I'm gonna give you two options, okay? I mean, I'm gonna give you two options. Obviously, I think my work is worth buying, okay? Three options. I mean, I think my intervention book is a good primer for what to do in the weight room. Uh, especially if you want to, uh, you know, you know, be a better athlete. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go in two directions on this. First, um, I, I I really like the the books of Clarence Bass. Uh, he, he's at the letter C C Bass dot com. Um, his his books are illuminating. Every so often, I'll go back and I'll read all of them. Uh, the the book I would probably I got to move my daughters out of the way. The book I would probably uh, recommend the most, well, obviously his first book, Ripped, is really something to read, but it's his book here called Challenge Yourself. I always thought Challenge Yourself was his best book. Um, and uh, I like it because it gives you, uh, the nice thing, uh, Clarence, I think, is about 10 or a little bit, maybe more than that, older than me. So I've been reading his books kind of behind him. So you know, he has, he has advice when he was in his 40s giving us advice. You know, I was, I was basically just, so he must be like 20 years old than me. And then when I got to my 40s, I reread that stuff. And I was like, okay, that makes more sense now. When I read his books he wrote about when he was in his 50s, when I turned 50, I went, oh, yeah, that makes a lot more sense now. Uh, but I would say Great Expectations uh, is pretty good. Um, that That's probably the one. Uh, pardon me. Great Expectations is really good. Uh, Take Charge is the last one. But challenge yourself. He talks about Olympic lifting in there. And then one other selection, uh, if if you're looking for general training, Pat Flynn has a book, and I hate the title, and everyone knows what the title's going to be, though. But I think it's called, like, Paleo Fitness for Dummies. Um, if you decide to go that route, email me. I, I, I sent Patrick pages of reflections because I did his entire 180-day program. Uh, which, if you know me, is something I I do a lot of. If, if when I recommend something, I, I've done it. Um, so let's go through. Let's go through. If you're a general trainer, a general, uh, just you know, for most people, okay, then it'd be spring chicken, just eat, the wrestling conditioning encyclopedia, Pat Flynn's book, uh, Paleo Fitness for Dummies. If you're more like a bodybuilder, or you're even a little bit older. I still feel comfortable with Just Eat and Spring Chicken. I think those are very good. Maybe challenge yourself with uh, Clarence Bass. And maybe just pick up another Clarence Bass book. 
or pick up one of my musings like attempts or something like that, which I don't have a single copy of, which is interesting. Uh, I hope that helped. Uh, so, the, uh, so you can get away with just four books, spring chicken, <laughs> just eat, challenge yourself. That's not bad. That's not bad. Paleo fitness for dummies. And then I also met, recommended the, uh, wrestling physical conditioning encyclopedia. Uh, that's, that's a pretty good shelf. Now from there, you can then start reading other authors and then realize that almost all of us just basically cut and paste. We're like a modern college professor that just cuts and pastes other people's work and <clears throat> doesn't give attributes. All right. Good question. And it was fun to answer it. Okay. Thank you. Jim, I'm a 37 year old man in decent shape. I used to have bad posture, but I've improved with hangs, overhead squats, and Turkish getups. Well, I got to tell you, I, I, I just, I mean, I just want to say applause and good for you. I, I wish more people would hear that sentence, what you just said. You fixed your bad posture with hangs, overhead squats, and Turkish getups. That, that makes me very happy. Since following easy strength, I've noticed improvements in my strength and fitness. Good. The, sh uh, the shopping feels lighter. I can climb harder routes when I go bouldering. In many ways, life has gotten a little easier. However, I have tried Copera. Copera. That's I know it's that Bra Brazilian kind of dance fighting. Uh, it looks like dancing, but it's a method of fighting. For the first time, and I was truly humbled. Okay, right here, everybody. Everyone lean in. Listen to this. I'll clean it up for the internet. Don't ever mess around in another man's game. Now, you could also say another woman's game, but that's not the way the quote was told me. When I used to work for a certain professional basketball team, uh, helping them in the weight room, went out to court one time, and one of the guys I've been pushing rather hard said, let's see you make a shot. And I got the ball up, and he slapped that ball into row 92. And, he, and then I nodded my head, and I said, yeah, don't mess around in another man's game. So you uh, essentially, you're in good shape for some things, and then you walked into somebody else's game. Some of this could be coordination, but I also feel that I lack some form of mobility or athleticism. Uh, this has made me wonder if I have a gap in my training. Would you recommend a movement practice of any kind? The most repeatable and doable form for me would be 10 minutes I can do anything before or after easy strength programs. Well, you know, this kind of boggles my mind a little bit that you asked, but uh, if you're on the site, danjohnuniversity.com, just go to the, the book, Pressing Reset by Tim Anderson. Uh, I think Tim Anderson's uh, Pressing Reset uh, Original Strength is the best mobility program ever done. And the reason I like it so much, <laughs> well, it's going to sound weird, but, you know, he'll say it feels good to feel good. So we'll be doing a thing with, with Tim at a workshop, and then he'll say, well, if it feels better to do this, you know, do that, or feels better to do... Th and so there isn't... A, you know, you, you try to get better by repetitions, by calming the nervous system. You know, you always keep your tongue in the roof of your mouth. You let your eyes lead everything. And you, um, in somatics, they talk it, they call it pendiculation. You want to just kind of pump yourself into being more mobile. Never force. Never force. And I got to tell you, that really made a huge difference for me. So when we do easy strength in my gym, the rest periods are an original strength movement. Um, you know, between your sets of military press, you could still just hang. Between your, pardon me, your sets of deadlift, you could sit at the bottom of the goblet squat. Between your sets of, say, chin-ups or pull-ups, you could pop to the ground and do what he calls six-point, uh, he calls them rocks. We, we call them in our gym six-point rocks. Um, but I think that's the best form of mobility. Uh, it's gentle. It makes sense. Uh, I always feel better. We On Thursdays, all I do is an hour of uh, original strength. Interesting, that's also the hungriest I get all week long. <laughs> Doing something gentle and easy makes me st starve. Well, I should tell you something about the rest of my training. But uh, yeah, I think that's the best, and I stand by it. I have a couple of videos here on YouTube about mobility. There's some exercises we do as, that are assessments, the windmill stick and the stony stretch. There are assessments and stretches. And there's a whole, I think it's about an hour, 
there may be a couple, but I know one's a full hour fall long video on uh, uh, what we do on Thursdays, our tonic mobility day. And there's another one of me just picking, I think I just pick five and I just do, I do 55 egg rolls uh, for the camera, which is as boring as it sounds, but it might be worth watching. Hope that helped. Thank you. Well, we got a question from John. I'm a university professor in philosophy and religion at a Catholic university. I'm going to make the case that I should get to teach a course in our catalog with the title Spirituality and Sport, and I'm very excited about it. I, I think it's a great idea. Some of the most illuminating things in my entire life, I mean, outside of maybe the birth of my daughters, and he, uh, my grandchildren too, and some, because especially with the one, because of the, the, the struggles birth, uh, Lindsay, my daughter, uh, barely survived uh, birth. And then her son barely survived birth. And I'm just, you guys got to knock this off. But outside of, then a, you know, a few interventions of coincidence in my life, um, the, the most eye-opening spiritual experience in my life has been, especially when it comes to uh, uh, personal growth, has been in sports. So I, I like this. Are there any texts in your study of theology or religion that you think should would be especially good for a course with that title. And then he says, this is a tough one, John, I'm particularly interested in primary sources. Well, I mean, I, okay, so, you know, I would suggest the Rig Veda or the Rig Vada, depending on where we are this week. Um, I've always thought that the Rig Veda was a very good, there's a lot of discussions of arrows and bravery and those kinds of things. Um, another text that you probably want to look at is the Odyssey. Um, uh, Ulysses is a champion discus thrower. And the reason he comes out to win the performance is really good. He's getting heckled by the young boys. Uh, you're too old for this. And he goes out and he schools them. So Rig Veda, you know, the Odyssey, uh, that's not a bad start. Uh, in, uh, the sacred scriptures of the Jews and Christians, I would probably pull in some of the fasting experiences. Um, de depending on your translation, uh, Jesus' 40 day fast in the desert, uh, might be an illuminating thing. Uh, I've, I've often used that as a, uh, an example about, you know, Prepare, you know, preparation. You know, I work with track and field and Lent uh, happens in spring. Uh, and I've always told my athletes, this is also, this is a mar marvelous time to prepare yourself for the nationals, the conference, the state meet, whatever it is. Because, you know, you know, pick a few Lenten resolutions that will support your long-term goals. And they'll say, like what? And I'll say, well, to some of my athletes, I'll say, why don't you quit drinking alcohol? Mm -hmm. Some of my other athletes, why don't you quit shoveling you know, so much candy or whatever crap it is in your mouth. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, this isn't a primary source, but I think there's a section that's actually good for athletes. Uh, in William Cahill's book, How the Irish Saved Civilization, the chapters discussing uh, St. Patrick and St. Augustine. I think there's there'd be some value in there. And then, of course, you know, uh, you know, there's just... I mean, every world tradition has a, a layer of fasting and a, a layer of meditation. If you can find some good uh, works on meditation from the Taoist tradition, I got to tell you, and, and I'll probably get some negative feedback from this one, but I've always thought that the book, the Tao, the T-A-O of Pooh, P-O-O-H, the Tao of Winnie the Pooh makes a fabulous reading, and especially for college students because it's Winnie the Pooh, and it just really opens up a lot of little things. It's not a complete list I just gave you, but you, know, you can certainly start from there. Uh, you know, in every tradition, you know, there's there's Ramadan, there's, uh, there's just so, uh, the Greek Orthodox, you can actually go online and look at their dietary uh, demands. They have, uh, they have four additional, uh, fasting periods in the year that like maybe Catholics wouldn't have. They also have certain days of the week where you get, you can't drink wine or, or you another day of the week you have to skip cheese. It might be worth going through that too. It, it, and again, it's just a calendar, but the insights from it might be really valuable because of the love. Okay. So, you know, whenever you talk about sports, 
you always talk, you have to talk about nutrition and that's a nice little uh you got theology here you got sports here this is a nice little place of the two intersect number two i was hoping i might be able to have one class meeting each week to be a practicum or lab day in which we go to the gym or out in the field to move our bodies and pay attention to the inner or spiritual component of those activities. However, I am very concerned that the exercises we do be safe and accessible for a class of as many as 20 students. Do you have any ideas for exercise or activities that might be especially appropriate and meet those criteria? Yeah, uh, the Zen, the, 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 the Key Society of America, K-I, and I hope I can just look and find those books, but there's a real good chance I won't because I don't know where I would file. <laughs> when I say file my books, that's uh, uh, one of the bigger lies of the day. I kind of just throw them up there. But the the Tokai, Toshi Tokai, they're called the Books of Key, K-I, and he recommends certain stretches. And there's also a section in one of his books about in, in, in improving your golf game and being more confident. I like that. So that those, his stretching exercises, basically it's a, a long hamstring stretch and then you straddle the legs out and you do a long hamstring stretch there, a long hamstring st stretch there, and then you go down the middle. And the last one is you sit in child's pose and then you lean back on your back. But it would be interesting if you could combine a meditative class with something you might do for accuracy. And it could be something as simple as, uh, uh, one of the first days you could do something as simple as, you know, they quiet their mind and they have to throw a ping pong ball into a red cup, which most college students seem to know how to do that. But to get them to throw that ping pong ball into the red cup, you know, in different states uh, of arousal and no arousal, that might be fun. Another thing you might want to look back into is the basics of uh, like uh, Tai Chi. Um, if you can get your people to stand on the horse stance for a while and then to have them move in through some of the different archer poses, that might be a real fun thing. Uh, almost no equipment will be used in any of my ideas. And, uh, but I would look into that. The, I would look into this concept, maybe call it, maybe call it movement meditations or something like that. Uh, obviously, you know, you got to be careful with like yoga, uh, because yoga, what yoga is and what yoga was is not the same, but it'd be a fun thing. And then from there, you know, obviously you could, you know, also then bring out some, some of the classic ideas from the Greek, uh, Olympics, you know, uh, Milo of Crota whose father-in-law was Pythagoras, who gave us a theorem about a squared equals b squared. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Uh, Pythagoras was not only a math guy, but he was also a coach. So that's always high praise. Uh, I, I like the idea. I want you to work out a few, a few things. There's one other person I want you to consider on this too. His name is Frank Froelich, Froelich, F-R-O-E-L-I-C-H. And he talks a lot about play. And he has some drills that are very safe. They're very fun. That might be worth your time. Uh, you might even want to look at the old book. It wasn't called the Zen Approach to Skiing, but it was a the the inner athlete. It was the, the it, it was a it was a book on skiing where so many of the drills were basically just Tai Chi. Uh, these these are older books. You might not for the, you know the problem with the problem with the last few years is we've gotten away from what we used to have. There was a lot of books in the 70s and 80s on developing the mind to improve uh, athletics. Today, I feel like it's taking more supplements to improve athletics. So it's great. That's a great. Uh, when you do get this, I want you to get in touch with me. and We'll talk on the phone for a while. All right. Thank you. We got another John asking some questions. All right. I am currently training and eating for fat loss. Got about another 10 pounds to go, which I'm struggling with. Mm. That's funny, that last 10. I, he works 50 to 60 plus hours a week, full-time single parent, 46-year-old man. As I'm becoming more experienced with kettlebell training, my appetite is soaring, which can lead to overeating and even worse, the occasional snack incident. So I know that protein and fiber are satiated and slow to digest, 
keep me fuller for longer. And I'm happy with fasting between dinner and about midday the next day. But I'm looking for guidance on healthy eating to promote fast loss and complement strength training. Any advice, guidance, or directions you can, you can give me? Well, you know, I mean, obviously I wrote a book called Easy Strength for Fat Loss, which you obviously are following because you're doing so much of it. The, the biggest thing I would do is when it comes to food, you got to prep. So I'm just going to give you two examples of what I think you should do. So there's, I shop at a place called Macy's right over here, and they've got this fajita mix. So I take the fajita mix, I come home, pour it on the cutting board, and I just chop it all up. So it's onions and three different kinds of peppers. Chop it all up. I slice one cucumber and I, you know, I cube one cucumber. I throw it all together. I mix it up. When it's time to eat, I throw in some olive oil. I throw in some uh, generally red wine vinegar. I stir it around and there you go. Um, there's that famous Greek salad or depending where you are, I've heard it called Lebanese salad. I've heard it called, let's just say every country in the Eastern Mediterranean has the same food. Now, some people put feta in it, and I think that helps. A uh, caveat on this, uh, if you add the oil and the, the vinegar and the uh, feta, you have to eat it fairly quickly. Otherwise, I mean, honestly, you can't even, it looks so bad the next day you'll have no interest. So, you know, you make a big bowl of this, you scoop out some of it, you throw it in a smaller bowl, you add the olive oil and vinegar, you stir it around and boom, there you go. You'll keep one of those in the fridge. And the other one I keep in the fridge is I take, uh, I take this combination of seed thing. Again, you buy it at the store. It's got flax seed, hemp seed, and uh, maybe sesame seeds or whatever. There's another small seed in it. And then I pour a little layer in the bottom of the bowl. I, I pour in a bunch of oatmeal. I pour uh, uh, cinnamon. And then I pour uh, vanilla protein in it and I stir it up, and then I put it in the fridge, cover it, put it in the fridge overnight. So I always have overnight oats. And the overnight oats that I eat has protein in it, it has extra fiber, and and what's nice is if I find myself getting caught in a hunger, I'm hungry. If I eat a bowl of this Greek salad, I'm not sure there's an, I mean, yeah, there's calories in there, but honestly, my body's not, uh, you know, I'm not going to, pork up on Greek salad. And with the oatmeal, it's also very satiating. So the number one thing you've got to do, and especially in the situation you're in there with being a full-time single parent with the long work hours, when you go shopping, the first thing you do when you go home, you've got to chop vegetables. You've got to, you've got to get the meats ready. You've got to get the oatmeal ready. You've got to make the Greek salad. That extra half hour, 45 minutes of work, the moment you come home from shopping, and I would suggest a big shop once a week. Don't let yourself get in the idea of this. Those small shops are, you know, we all, we, we've known for a generation they're a, not a good financial decision. But I think from a health perspective, if I go shopping hungry, I make bad choices. <laughs> the understatement of the year. So th that's what I'd recommend to you. Shop, come home, prepare, fill the fridge up with, and I, that's why I use those Pyrex bowls that are clear so I can look in the fridge and I can see what I can eat. And if I can stay ahead of that, good things tend to happen with me too. Um, protein, veggies, water. And then, but to make that happen, preparation, preparation, preparation. So John, I hope that, I hope that works for you, okay? And good luck to you. Um, when I was your age, I was doing a lot of full-time parenting. It's in working, it's tough, my best. Okay, Raul. I have a couple of questions. I'm having knee replacement surgery soon and wonder if you might have any suggestions on things you might know to help post-surgery or even before. Okay, Derek, let's answer that question first because the second question doesn't really tie into that particular thing. I suggest this whenever you go in for a surgery, you know what's coming. I mean, obviously, certain other surgeries you don't, but if it's a big, if it's a big surgery, a hip replacement, hip, knee, shoulder, you've got usually got some time. I, I would strive to go into surgery in the best condition you can get yourself in. Um, I, I think the week you go in, I really think you should really get up. I take sugar-free, orange-flavored Metamucil 
because the last thing you want is to be constipated because of the drugs they're going to put in you are going to, they're going to constipate you. A lot of water, um, walk as much as you can. If you can lift, lift as much as you can, whatever you can do, do. Um, if, if you get a surgery time, like, uh, I don't know, you have to be at the hospital eight, roll out of bed early and get a walk in before surgery or whatever. After surgery, do your best to work out whatever you can work out. Now, a knee replacement, it's only one side. If you can work the other leg, that's great. You probably can work your upper body. You can push, you can pull, you know, you can even do some chair work and, you know, you know, just do some, just do some stuff. That'll help a lot. And then after surgery, uh, that is such a good time to clean up your diet. Um, even though you're going to want comfort foods because of what's going on, uh, if you can stay with the protein and veggies, I think you'll be a lot happier. Okay, now to the other questions, okay? Secondly, how long is too long to work out in a single session? I'm currently using the workout generator, general workout. I chose the hour long. After that, I ride the bike for 30 minutes using the Maffetone parameters. I noticed that other workouts, such like e easy strength for fat loss, only go for an hour. Am I going too long? By the way, I'm 61 years old and still work out three to four days a week using the workout generator. Well, I mean, Raul, I mean, that's that's great. Um, I don't, let's do it this way. Think about it this way. You have, let's just say you do the workout generator, three hour and a half workouts a week. And that's it. That's pretty good. <laughs> you know, you only need 100 minutes, uh, according to the research, to get the benefit a week to get the benefits of exercise. You're doing that, you know, almost three times as much, almost. I mean, within throwing distance of getting that. Uh, so is it is it too much work? Well, no. Uh, the, the reason we go to the hour workouts with the fat loss happen, uh, the, 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 the uh, easy trades for fat loss, is because we're going five days a week for an hour and then the other two day, days a week, you just walk if you can if you can make it work. So, in my, let's see, in your case, you're going four and a half hours a week. In my case, I'm going five hours a week. Now, when you had that fourth workout, you go ahead of me again, but I walked those other two days. Um, so it, you have to look at it that way. Versus, so sometimes even my own workouts, when you compare them, you sort of get yourself a little bit in the apples and oranges, kind of that you know cliche concept. You're you're basically in the week, you and I are both, if I'm doing uh, easy strength for fat loss and you're doing the workout generator followed by the uh, the bike, we're both doing about the same number of hours a week. Memorize what I'm about to tell you. Everyone listening memorizes. Rose training three hour and a half training sessions a week. He's doing pretty well. He's 61. He's taking care of business. He's getting the job done. If he really wants to improve and he's going to enter a contest, I mentioned this before, that's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The benefits of what you're getting in the, we'll just summarize. We're just going to say you work out five hours a week. Okay. You, you work out five hours a week or I'll say six. You work out six hours a week. The benefits you get at six hours a week are here and they're good and they're solid. The tweaks you make to get yourself contest ready for the platform 24 hour day commitment, seven days a week. You're kind of in, uh, Arnold called stay hungry, but really, if you've ever really tried to diet down, it's stay starving. Okay. <laughs> You're always hungry. All the, all the workouts, all the extra cardio, all the tanning, all the manscaping, all the stuff, the posing practices. If you move up from five hours a week to just say 10 hours a week, you're not going to get five more additional hours of benefit. For most people. So here's this minimum you're doing here. And then here's this maximum you're doing here. The steps in between, that's the fuzzy part of my world. Um, you know, in finance, they sometimes have that great concept called the barbell. You know, you have this, you have this wall of money you make, uh, in, uh, um, let's just say it's your nine to five job, though, you know, a lot of people are in a different world now. Here you are in your nine to five job and it gives you uh, you get a nice salary, you get health, you get dental, you get eyes, you get retirement, and you get bonuses. Good. Then over here on the far end here, 
you invest in the craziest ideas you possibly can because one of those investments might, you know, shoot to the moon. Uh, I did that with an investment. I'm not going to tell you what it was. And uh, the first day it went public, I doubled my money. And I'm not saying that I'm very smart. Just when I looked at it, I was like, who in the hell would want to do that? Well, these guys. And I thought it was a good idea. Uh, I understood what it was. I understood everything. So over, so you have this one side, you have the solid wall, and then you're rolling the dice with some of your money. Uh, there's nothing new to this. Warren Buffett says the same stuff. Everyone else does too. Uh, I first heard this by Peter Lynch, I think, uh, beating, beating the street or something like that. So you're working out three, four days a week for an hour and a half. You're getting all the benefit. If you decide to enter a contest and it's 24 seven, you will get more benefits. In the middle, middle is hazy. In the middle is hazy. Sometimes, and I, I bet you a lot of our listeners know this, you increase the amount of time you train in a week and you get very, very little from it. Now, it's obvious this is Economics 101. We would teach this to you when we talked about running a fast food restaurant. Um, you keep hiring people and then you just suddenly run out of room. The example I always use was a local place here in Utah where during the rush hour, it was one person's job to say, do you want lemon with that? So, you know, you would be shuttling your way down with your food and they would say, you know, during the rush, the afternoon, uh, the big lunch rush, someone was hired to say, do you want lemon with that? They give you lemon. Do you want lemon with that? They give you lemon. Do you want lemon with that? No, I don't. They wouldn't give you lemon. Well, when it's slow, there's no need for the lemon person. So when you start thinking about your training from an economic view, sometimes just sticking with three or four workouts for an hour and a half is far better than worrying about whether you're getting enough. Raul, you're getting enough. And it seems to me, just by the way you're typing this, that things are going well. Good job. Well, there you go. That was a short one today. Uh, remember, if you have a question, you'll send it to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'm here each and every week. Uh, this is a podcast. This is a co- podcast based on your questions. So you email them. I'll answer them. And like I always say, until next time, let's all keep on lifting and learning. Thank you.